Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Uh, I know I wasn't supposed to come on until next week, but this is a special one because of what the Lord taught me. And I didn't want to sit on it because, because this is about sukkah. And, and it was so important that what I learned, I wanted to share with you. So I pray that you had a good week. And if you had time to think about what it was that we talked about last week, but I don't want to cut through all of that. I want to get straight into this because I'm so excited about what I learned and I just want to share it with you. So perhaps you might want to, you know, incorporate it into your life too. So without further ado, let's pray so I can get right into this circuit lesson. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we come together to give you praise and thanksgiving, Lord. We come together around your word. We come together to learn of you, to take upon your yoke and learn of you. We come, Lord God, because you are our life source. In you we move and breathe and have our being. We come, Lord God, so that we can be transformed into the image of your dear son. We come, Lord God, because you are our Alpha Omega, beginning end and everything in between. Lord, we come to submit who we are to you, good, bad, and ugly indifferent in everything else lord god such as we have we give unto thee we ask you lord god to accept this these broken vessels these poor clay jars lord god accept them and receive them lord god and correct us lord god and fix our cracks so that you can fill us with your spirit lord god and use us for your own glory lord we desire to be what you called us to be so we could have what you said we could have so teach us, Lord God, because what we've been doing ain't been getting us no fruit. So we're asking you, Lord God, to show us the way. We will go, Father God. We will do, my Lord. We will say, Master, whatever it is that you would have us to do, to be, to say, or to will. For your glory, Lord God. For your glory in this earth. We will do it all for Jesus. Hallelujah because he did it all for us. So we thank you, Lord God, for this moment, this special presentation, Lord God, this special lesson that you have given unto me to share with my brothers and sisters. I thank you for it. Lord, now move me out of the way so that it can be done properly and according to your own good pleasure. I receive you all you have for us, Lord God. We receive it by faith in the finished works of Jesus, our Savior, our Lord and our King. We thank you for it all. Hallelujah, Master. Hallelujah and amen. Hallelujah and amen. And I'm sorry, I didn't ask you how you were. So how are you? I pray that you had a good week. And I'm really excited, so I just want to get right into the lesson. Because, like, it's really exciting to me. Because, oh, hallelujah. Mm. Tuesday. On my way home, oh, I don't want this. This is not what I want. This is music, and I don't want music. So go back to where I was. That's all. We'll just change the music. That's fine. Tuesday, on my way home from work, I was on the train. And a Jewish brother got on the train. A Jewish man, because this was an older gentleman, an elder. A Jewish man got on the train. And when he got on the train, he got on the train, he had this this package with him, this long plastic bag. And inside the tube was a bunch of beautiful green branches. So he sat down next to me, you know, and, 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 you know, he was traditionally dressed. So we usually, I usually don't, you know, interject with, with, with them or anything. I just mind my business. But this man had this, these branches and I kept staring at them because they were really quite beautiful. So, you know, I, I later learned that the branches were called lulav, L-U-L-A-V, lulav. I hope I'm pronouncing it right. I don't want to say it wrong. But anyway, after staring at the branches, curiosity got the best of me. And I had to ask him. So I said, excuse me, sir. And he was very kind. He turned around and he said, yes. I said, may I ask you a question? He said, yes. I said, 
what are those? And that's when he told me they were lulips. And I said, are they used for religious reasons? And he said, yes, they are. And then I, he went on to, you know, tell me about sukkah. Well, when he finished telling me about it, you know, he got, we, we finished, we had a very short conversation. I think it made it last, not even 10 minutes. And when he finished the conversation, you know, he went back to doing whatever he was contemplating on. And I went back into contemplating with myself because I had heard about Sukkot. You know, I'd seen the booths and everything, but I never really understood what it was about until I had spoken with this man. So by the time I got home, my curiosity was like on, on fire. So I came straight to Master. And I was like, well, Lord, Sukkot. You know, because I understand that we are siphoned onto the olive tree and that, you know, we are in Christ and Christ is Jewish. And although he did fulfill the Lord, there are things that we are required to do. So I want to grow up into Christ. So I want to get this right. So I'm getting, you know, I go straight to the Holy Ghost. So I went to him and he led me to Leviticus 23. So I'm going to read, you know, I'm going to start at Leviticus 23, 34, but I'm going to move through the scriptures to bring this all together. Like he taught me, I'm going to give to you. How does, how does it go? Such as it was given unto me, I give unto you. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Father, we ask that you, that your word come alive in our lives, Lord. Master, let it come alive in us, Lord, so that we can live it. Master, let it come alive in us so we can live it, so that we can be, hallelujah, like you would want us to have. I thank you for it coming alive in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. Leviticus 23, 34 says this, Master, Say to the Israelites, on the 15th day of the seventh month, the Lord's festival of tabernacle begins, and it will last for seven days. Now, Sukkot has been a week-long fall festival within the Jewish com community for thousands of years. Thousands of years they've been celebrating this. And this year, Sukkot was celebrated from last Friday September 20, 29th, I believe, until yesterday, October 6th. It's, se it's seven days. Like Master said, you know, in Leviticus 23, 34, it lasts for seven days. Now, this instruction comes straight out of Scripture. And remember what I told you that Master's teaching me that this is a book of instruction and everything in it pertains to us in life and godliness. Well, sukkah comes straight from the Bible as well. It's a commandment from the Lord. Now, Acts 15, 13 says, After they had become silent, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God at the first at first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And with this words of the prophets, the, and with this, the words of the prophet agree, just as it was written, after this, I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins and I will set it up so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does all these things. I'll read it again. Acts 15, 13. And after they had become silent, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God at first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree. As it is written, after this I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins and I will set it up, so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does all these things. Now again, I went to Master and I asked him about Sukkot, but I asked him about Sukkot and relationship to me. Because I'm not a Jew. 
I was born a Gentile. I'm reborn in Christ who is a Jew. And I'm fastened onto the olive tree, which is the branch that he has chosen for himself. So I too am his people after his name through Christ. So where do I fit in? And suck it. Because the Old Testament is a foreshadow of the New Testament. So I have to find myself in it, right? So I go to master, my teacher, and I asked him. And this is how he started me out. He took me to Leviticus to 23, 34 to show me that it is a requirement, that it is a commandment from God for the people of God. And that it is a tabernacle, a festival of tabernacles, and that the, ta the feast is supposed to last for seven days. And then he took me to Acts 15, 13 that tells me, hallelujah, how the, the Hebrews, the Jewish community, the chosen, Abraham's seed first came about in the beginning. Like he says in Acts 15, 13, Acts 16, 14 rather, Simon has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. He visited the Gentiles because all humans originally after Adam fell, were Gentiles. Because Gentiles are, are anyone who's not a friend of God, anyone who's not a child of God, anyone who was not his people. And he hadn't taken out of him, out of us, his people until Abraham. So at first he visited the Gentiles because he visited the Gentiles. All humans were once Gentiles. All humans were enemies of God, even the Hebrew and Jewish nation. All have fallen and come short of the glory of God. Thanks to Adam, no human being was born righteous. However, these were, were accepted by Yahweh because of Abraham, because of Abram, who began his pilgrimage as well as a Gentile. Remember, Abraham was a Chaldean when he first started out, and they were idol worshippers. They were known to be astronomers. They were well-known astronomers and studied the stars. And it was probably during, you know, a stargazing session when Abraham's heart reached out to God because, you know, he wanted to know who the true God was because the, the, the statues weren't working for him. So he had a desire to know who the true who the true God was. And I believe that while he was out there stargazing, because that's what his people did, you know, he touched the heart of God. So God reached out to him. Because when we pre when we pull on God, when we seek him, he looks to be found. So Abraham had a heart to seek for him. So he did. And God reached out to him because Abraham reached out to God. And that's why he was chosen. That's how they began their relationship. God revealed himself to Abraham then, and from then on out, their connection was, was made. And Abraham followed God. He followed his directions. And that's why they were chosen. He chose Abraham to use to make a people, like he said in, in Acts 15 and 14. He visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And that's what he did with Abraham. Hebrews 11, 8 tells us, By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance. And he went out, not even knowing where he was going. That's how the relationship cultivated. Because Abraham followed directions. He followed the instructions. And this is the type of faith that we need to have a relationship with our Creator. This is the type of relationship that we need to have a relationship with God because God hasn't changed. This is the same type of common union, communion, common union that he wants with all of us, all of his children. God created us in his image and he did that so he could fellowship with us. He loves us and his will be done. He will fellowship with us, all those whosoever will. In 1 Chronicles 28, we're told that David wasn't allowed to build the temple for the Lord. Even if he wanted to, he couldn't build it. So what type of tabernacle was God talking about 
when he said that he would rebuild his tabernacle. Now, according to Britannica, a tabernacle is a dwelling. And according to the Hebrew Bible, a Tanakh, a tabernacle is a dwelling place, a residence. So in the scripture, the tabernacle is the residence or a dwelling, a tent. It was a tent where the congregation or the people met while they were going through the exodus from, from, from Egypt to the promised land. This was a place where the people met and this was also a place where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. The original design for this came directly from the Spirit of God to Moses. And Moses built it according to specifications. Remember I told you God is all about these specifications. We must build this kingdom according to his specification, according to this book. Now, Moses received his, his specifications to build the temple. I mean, not the temple, the tabernacle, the tent of meeting from the Lord. And he did it. And it was a mobile unit of tents, separate tents that were joined together as one. Beautiful. Where the people met in different sections, separate but together. Like us on the vine. Hallelujah. Oh, I feel you coming. Here I see your master. Hallelujah. Here I master. Here we go. Yes, but joined together where the people gathered to worship and their period of migration. Oh, Master, I love you too. And, and the heart or the center of this tabernacle was where the Ark of the Covenant was. And that represented the presence of God. Hallelujah. Abba said he would rebuild this type of structure. And it was to be fashioned after the prototype that he designed or of the David, after the manner of David, who was a tabernacle as well. Acts 13.22 says, after removing Saul, master made David their king. God testified concerning him, himself. He said, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. And he will do everything I want him to do. See, God chooses his leaders. We have to go to him to find out who they are. He has a way. And he had picked David because he had a relationship with David. Because David reached out to him too when he was in the wilderness tending those sheep. God never asked David to build him a structure. He never asked David to build him a place to live, even though David wanted to build him one. God doesn't need us to do anything for him except obey his commands. And even that is to our benefit. When we follow these instructions, it's for us, for our good, for the good of us, for the good of our community, for the good of our family, for the good of our nation, for the good of our world. David was a mighty warrior, and he fought many battles in the name of the Lord, all of which God was right there with him, helping him to win each battle. God loved David. Even when David was in his fallen humanity, God loved him, because God's love never fails. And like so many of us, David was subject to the temptations of this world. He was subject to the temptations of man, too. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. David suffered all of those, yet he was still a tabernacle. And these are the same traps that Satan uses to trap us today. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. For David, his fall had a name, and her name was Bathsheba. And after he got with Bathsheba, everything went to hell in a handbasket. 1 Samuel 16, 13 says, So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. And then Samuel went on to Ramah. But David, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Because David was a tabernacle. For the Lord. 
David was a tent for the Lord to dwell in. King David had the Holy Spirit and that allowed him to defeat the bear and the lion and Goliath and everything else that David did, all the miraculous feats that David accomplished in the Bible. He did it because he had the Spirit of God with him and with him, on, upon him. And this is how God wants to empower every believer. But like the tabernacle that David was, we too have to want it. We too have to want to spend time in his presence, learning about him, making him remember our best friend and our favorite, favorite everything. Because that's what David was. David loved the Lord and loved to spend time and sing songs and, and the Lord was his friend. And that's why David had the Lord's heart because the Lord had David's. Then that's why the Lord had David's heart. No, that's why, yes, that's why David had the Lord's heart. Because David had the Lord's. He loved being in his presence. And that's what we have to do. We have to want to be in his presence. It was a choice he made while tending his sheep. And it's a choice that each one of us has to make every day. We have the purpose to spend time in the presence of God. We have the purpose to spend time in the presence of his spirit. This is how God rebuilds his tabernacle, according to the instructions. This was the way he built David's tent. So this is how he wants to build ours. We are to be living stones, He used, and we are to be the living stones that he uses to build his kingdom. Remember, the conversation is about the sukkah. Remember, this all started because it's about the sukkah and the new creation. That's what it's about. And during the sukkah, those who observe it build tents. They build the little booths that they sit in, they dwell in during these seven days. And I know you've seen them because I've seen them on the train when I ride the D train. So it passes a lot, lot, it passes through the Jewish community. And a lot of those homes during this time have built their little tents in their yards. You know, and I've always seen them for years, but I've never really knew what they were all about. But that's what that is. That's sick it. And they eat and fellowship in these, t in these tents, and some of them even sleep out there. It's amazing. And they do this, this festival and this dedication for seven days. And the tent represents how Yahweh provided for them through their migration from Egypt to the promised land. They use the time to remind them that God is all sufficiency because Abba is all we need. They use it to remind them that God is all they need. He will provide. They commune under the stars to remind them that when all else fails, God is there and he's got them. It reminds them that God was with them then and that he will be with them now. And this is the same God that is our God. He is our refuge just like he was theirs in Psalm 46. Psalm 51, 10, David says, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your way so that sinners will turn back to you. Hallelujah, Abba. Eversion dasi master. That's what he does, you know. He creates in us a pure heart and he renews the right spirit in us so that we have that joy of being saved. We have that blessed assurance. He grants us a willing spirit. We have to want it though. We have to want his spirit to sustain us. We have to want to submit. And then we can teach others so that others can turn and repent. Because we'll see, because we know, because we're living it. He's doing it in us. David recognized that his sinful actions when I carried on with Bathsheba and killing her husband and all of that stuff cost him his salvation. He was concerned. He didn't want to lose what he had. He needed God's presence. He needed God's spirit. He recognized that. 
And that was his plea. Lord, I know I messed up. But please don't take your spirit from me. Please don't cast take don't cast me away. Then this is the same principle that we learned in September. In that last lesson that I taught in September, when we talked about the if, you know, the one where Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians 15 that we gotta stay in the gospel. We must remain in the spirit of Christ. We got to stay on the vine to stay saved. Salvation is a never ending process. And until we are truly fully transformed, until we fully look like Christ, we got to stay on the vine because God ain't finished with us yet. Until we act like Christ and do the greater things that he said we're supposed to do, we need to stay there. And continue to learn of him. Because there's so much more for us to learn. We got to do a great work on this earth. And we need his spirit to do it. We need it. We need to become these. This is God's desired outcome. He wants to reside inside our human tabernacles. He wants to abide in the many mansions. He wants to live in his holy temples. Temples not made by hand. Hallelujah. Suckets for the spirit of Yahweh to abide in on the earth. That's what we are. New creations. Suckets for Christ. Hallelujah. Acts 15, 8, James says, God who knows the heart shows that he has accepted them, the Gentiles, by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. Just as he did to the Jews. He did not discriminate between us and them. For he purified their hearts by faith. He purified our hearts by faith in Jesus. So we could all be together. Hallelujah. God who knows the heart. He knows our heart. He knows that I love him. So he accepted me. And he filled me with the spirit. And he's changing my life. Peter explains that the inclusion of Gentiles was God's idea from the beginning. And it was confirmed by God when he filled the Gentiles with the evidence of the Holy Spirit's indwelling. The Gentiles spoke in a spiritual language, and Paul actually heard it for himself. That's why Paul knew that the Holy Spirit had filled them and was now available to whosoever willed. All they had to do was believe in Jesus and that he's the Christ and ask the Father. And this is sucking for the new creation. It is a festival of tabernacles. All who have offered themselves as a place for the Spirit of God to reside. All who have become vessels. All who have become jars, clay jars. All the mansions and the temples are tents. We humans are tents. You are a tent for spirit to live in. For the Holy Spirit to live in. You are a sucking, a sucker for God's spirit. Do you have a place in your heart for him to live? Do you have a place? Are you willing for him to come in and sit and sup with you to live in your temple, to live in your hut, to live in your tent? That's what sukkah is about. And it just ended Friday. And Saturday was the great feast of coming together, the great assembly. And this is what it means to us, the new creation. Acts 7, 47. But it was Solomon who built a house for him, not David. David didn't build the temple. Solomon built the temple. However, the Most High does not live in houses made by human hands. As the prophet said, heaven is my throne. The earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or where will my resting place be? Has not my hand made all of these things, you stiff-necked people? Your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. 
You were just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Ah! I bet those the light of him. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Suck it for the new creation is just that. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We have become the tent in which the Holy One dwells in. We are the covenant. Hallelujah. We are the kingdom. We are the new creations in Christ. Reborn in the Holy Spirit of God. Christians. Hallelujah. Christians are rebuilt structures made not by man's hand. Or man's logic as per Paul in 1 Corinthians 2.13. But those who re were reborn of God as per 1 John 5. Those have become tents of Christ. Those have become suckers. Those have become the dwelling place of the Lord. And this is the kingdom of God in the earth. The temples. The stones. And David, hallelujah, the shepherd boy from Bethlehem was the prototype to start this type of relationship to all. Acts 10.34 says, Peter began to speak and he says, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what happened throughout the providence of Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Over a thousand, over a little, a little over a thousand years later, after King David was filled with the Holy Spirit, another boy also was born in Bethlehem who had a similar encounter. This boy was special, and because he was one of a kind, he could reestablish a way for all humankind to share in his experience. Now, some 2,000 years later, this process is still taking place. Hallelujah. God is still rebuilding his circles for Christ to dwell in. And this is where the present tabernacle is located. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Again, the Bible is a blueprint of humankind from our beginning to this present age to the end of this age. Christians who believe the Old Testament is a foreshadow or a prototype of what is to come of the New Testament must also believe these truths. We also believe that Jesus fulfilled the requirements set forth under the Old Testament. So God isn't interested in our fancy edifices. He could care less about our church buildings. Because he doesn't want to live there. He refuses to. He's not going to live anywhere that we build with our hands. God isn't interested in our education or economic status either because he has the power to change all of that anytime he wants to. What God is interested in, what Christ is interested in, is your sukkah. Christ is interested in your tent. Christ is interested in your human body. He wants to live inside of you. He wants to fill you with his power. And this is the hope that brings glory to Yahweh. That each person be submitted to this reality. Because this is how we become one in Christ. Leviticus 23.36 says, For seven days you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. What time is it? Oh, I'm doing good. Leviticus 23.36 says, For seven days you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. On the eighth day, hmm, you shall have a holy convocation, and you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. It's a sacred assembly, hallelujah, and you shall do no customary work on it. 
This is what happened during their Sabbath. This is what happened during the Saturday after. This is what happened on this today, Saturday. This is what went on in the Jewish community everywhere. There was a great celebration, a great assembly. They all assembled into their sanctuaries. They all went into their places, excuse me, Lord, hallelujah, of worship. And they had a sacrifice offering made to the Lord, a sacred assembly that was special because it was an offering made by fire to the Lord, an offering made by fire, not by hand, not by man, but made by fire to the Lord. You get it? Sukkah is a feast of tabernacles. And for us, the reborn, reconstructed tabernacles of God's Holy Spirit, Sukkot is a time when we remember what God has delivered us from. It is a celebration of our God's ability to provide for his people. Sukkot for us is a time of tense, a time when we, the body of Christ, is reminded whose house we have chosen to become. Sukkot is a time for Christians to recommit their suckers to the Lord. It's a time for us to rededicate our bodies, our living sanctuaries to the Holy Spirit of Christ so that he can restore us, so that he can replenish us, so that he can renew us, so that he can reunite, hallelujah, the fire on the altar of each one of our hearts. That's what we're supposed to be. Fires on flame for the Lord. As per Leviticus 6.13, the flame must never go out on our altar. And that's what Sukkot does. It reminds us that the flame must always be burning within the tent, within the Holy of Holies, in our heart of hearts. The fire must never go out. This was the answer I received when I went to Master with my question about what does Sukkot have to do with me and how do I fit in to this celebration and when he gave me all of this it gave me food for thought and it actually gave me a better understanding of what hallelujah the new Jerusalem looks like this kind of stuff is what binds us all together onto the olive tree onto the vine in Jesus name and next year, Sukkot is going to be on October 16th. It's going to start on October 16th, and it's going to run through October 23rd. And I'm going to make myself ready to, be, to represent myself for those seven days as a living sacrifice before the Lord. I'm going to go back and get the instructions, and I'm going to follow them and be prepared. Because I, want to be the image of Christ in the earth. And the new creation created in Christ is the sacrifice of fire that Leviticus 23, 36 requires. Those who are baptized of fire as per Matthew and Luke 3, we are baptized with the Holy Spirit and fire. So we are made of fire. We are the offering that he's asking for. In Leviticus 36. So I'm going to prepare myself to be that. Remember, Jesus didn't come to do away with the law. He came to fulfill it. So let's, in Jesus' name. Amen? That's it. I told you it wasn't going to be long because it was quick. Because it's just a quick lesson that the Lord answered my question. And it was so important and so exciting to me that I wanted to share it with you. Because, because we are supposed to be one. And when it's all said and done, we will be. One people. Many pens, but one shepherd. And they are our brothers and sisters. And we are joined on. And it does matter. All the holidays matter. Because we are one. Sukkot is for us too. So we need to learn how to observe it like Master taught me. You can or not, like I said, this is about me growing. 
And I'm growing in Christ by his spirit. Hallelujah. He's teaching me like Paul said he should. By the spirit. And these are the things that he's teaching me. And these are the things that I'm going to practice. Because I said, I'm going to do the great works. Master said we could. I'm going to. I'm determined. Steadfast and immovable. Always abounding in his work. And that's what he said. These are his works. So I'm going for it. And this is part of it. This is what he taught me. So I'm sharing it with you. You can take it for what it's worth. This is what suck it is to the new creation. We are to celebrate it because the tents are no longer built by man. They've been built by the spirit of fire. Hallelujah. So get some in you. Christ in you. Get some fire in you. Christ in you. Get some power in you. Christ in you. Become a sucker for the Lord. Hallelujah. In Jesus name. Have a wonderful week. I'll see you next week. Back to normal stuff. So we can go on about the um. We're going to go back and finish talking about um, the legal side of the kingdom and, and the courtrooms and all of that stuff because that's what we were talking about. So that's where we're going back to. We're going to talk about that because we talked about rights and reasons. So we're going to go still, we're staying in that same concept of rights, reasons, you know, being saved, the legalities of the kingdom. Because it's not legalistic, but there are legalities. God has rules and regs. So we got to abide by it. So that was it. I hope you have a great week. I hope you enjoyed this because it floored me when I saw it. I mean, when he taught it to me, it was amazing. You know, I love learning about this stuff because I love being transformed. I got another level, you know, so I'm grateful. So I thank you for listening and I pray you have a wonderful service because like I said, this Saturday was their time of coming together assembly to, to present themselves, like Leviticus said, to present your offering of fire. So tomorrow when I go into service, I'm going to present my offering of fire to the Lord. Hallelujah. I'm going to make my own special pr presentation, just him and me, because that's what we go for, to meet him, not each other. So that's what I'm going to present myself as a living sacrifice. Hallelujah. Holy, I pray, and acceptable unto you, Master. Have a great week. God loves you. He loves us so much. We can't even understand it. I pray you have an amazing worship service. I pray you go into the house and fellowship. Touch and agree. Physically. Don't be afraid. Fear not. God is with you. And if God be for you, who could be against you? Nothing. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. If you go in faith, so go in faith. In Jesus' name. And have a wonderful communion service. Communing with each other. Not communion, but communing with each other. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Have a great one. God loves you and so do I. I'm out. I'm so finished. I'm so high in the Lord right now. I'm so happy. Hallelujah. Amen.